Welcome. In this video, I'm going to be going through the weather maps lab that you have. I'm going to provide a brief tutorial for you on how to complete this lab, similar to what we would do in class. Before this page, this is page three, there's a couple of pages that explain some of the some of the terms and the details that you will need in order to answer some of these questions. So do read the first two pages of this lab guide. But looking down here at the first problem that you will have to complete, this is a weather station example. And there are three cities here that you have to make weather stations for. And if you scroll down to page seven, there's a weather station guide and it shows you how to fill out this dot for a given set of weather data. So let's go down to page seven. Okay, here's all the symbols that you would need to fill out a weather station. And we have a demo down here. Okay, so here is how we want you to fill out your weather station. On A, that's the temperature. C is the dew point. So A can be found here, C is here. B is indicating the present weather. So if we go up to this chart here and look at what the present weather is, we see that three colons is drizzle. Okay, and then for the circle in the middle, since it is half dark, half light, that is indicating the cloud coverage. And the cloud coverage can be seen here. So if you leave it completely blank, that means there's no clouds. Now, one that often confuses students is the wind direction. That's G. Notice here the wind direction the, the direction of where this is pointing is indicating where the wind is coming from. So since this is pointing toward the east, that means that the wind is coming from the east. So wind comes from the direction of the arrow. If I was to draw a line through the top of this circle, then that would mean that wind is coming from the north. The end of the arrow here, the end of the arrow right here shows the speed of the wind. And that guide can be found right here under wind speed. Now this number here, H, this is the barometric pressure, but this is only the last three digits of the barometric pressure. So the actual barometric pressure of this particular weather station is 1015.9. But because barometric pressure goes from approximately 960 up to maybe uh, 1040, 1050, it is okay to just put in the last three digits. So if the barometric pressure is below 1000, let's say that it's 988.2, then you would just simply put 882. And the person reading that would know that it's 988.2, not 1,088.2. Okay. If we look at F, this is the pressure tendency. So this is showing that the pressure is rising and then steady, and that can be found here. E is the pressure change. And I don't think you're going to need to do E for the weather stations we have for you, but that's showing the pressure change. I is, is high cloud type, and again, we don't have that for you, and D is low cloud type. So if we go back up to the question, here's what you're given. You're given the temperature, the dew point, the pressure, the wind direction, the wind speed, the cloud coverage, and then what the current weather is. So you can find all of those examples in the figure on page seven. 
Okay, moving on to number two. For number two, you're gonna use figure two, which is on page nine, and you're gonna record the various weather data for these cities that is indicated on that figure. Number three, says determine the speed of the cold front by observing the front on two consecutive days. Figures two and three are two consecutive days of uh, the same map. So let's go look at figures two and three and find the cold front. Okay, here's figure two, so this is one day, and then the next day, here is figure three, okay? So the cold front is right here. Okay, and we see on this day it has moved, it's now here. So your job is to figure out over the course of 24 hours how far has that moved, and then you can determine the speed of the cold front. To determine how far it's moved, you can use this scale here at the bottom. You're gonna use the 40 degrees scale, and these are miles. So if this long is 300 miles, this long is 200 miles, and so forth. Now you will also notice that there's various weather stations at, at um, some of the cities here, and that tells you the wind direction and the wind speed at those cities, as well as the temperature and the dew point. These lines here are known as isobars. That means that the pressure on these lines is, is the same. So the pressure at every point on this line is 10, 12 millibars. The pressure at every point on this line is 10, 20 millibars. The pressure in between here, so let's say you wanted to know the pressure there, that would be in between 1016 and 1020. So you could take an average and say that's about 1017 or 1018 millibars. Notice these guys here, that's not a pressure, that's a temperature. And so that's similar to pressure in that it gives the same temperature along that line. Okay, so let's scroll back up and see some of the other questions that you'll be asked. So we went over number three. Number four asks you to select a cold front and a warm front and a temperature about 200 miles on either side. So I told you how to measure the temperatures. You're gonna look at a city on approximately 200 miles on either side of those fronts and record the temperatures. And then you're going to see that um, what happens to the temperature as the front moves through. So in front of the front, it should be one temperature. Behind the front, it should be a different temperature. And those will obviously be different cities that you're looking at. And then you'll say whether the temperature rose or fell. You're gonna do the same thing for number five, except for barometric pressure. Find a city on either side of the front, 200 miles, and then record the pressure on the city in front and the pressure on the city behind, and then determine whether it rose or fell as the, um, as the front moved through. Then you're gonna answer a few questions based on the, the uh, temperature changes and the pressure changes. You're gonna find the lowest pressure indicated by an isobar in figure two and the highest pressure. Moving on down to the next set of questions. You're also gonna use figures two and three for these. You're looking at the wind direction north of the high pressure cell. So let's go find the high pressure cell on, on figure two. That's right here. And so you want to look at a city on the north end of that and what the, the wind direction is doing. So if we do that, we see that the wind direction is coming from the south, as also indicated by this arrow. If we look to the right of it, there's a city right here, Winnipeg. What's the wind doing there? Down here, what's the wind doing here? And what's the wind doing in Calgary? Okay, so that's how you will answer those various questions. 
And then you'll determine what's the pattern around the cell. You'll do the same thing for a low pressure area, which is shown here. Then you're going to record the maximum pressure indicated on any isobar and the minimum pressure. Number five is asking you to draw isobars. So here you have a map with a bunch of pressures on it. So if I was trying to draw an isobar that was 200 or, um, or excuse me, it was 1020, 1020 point, uh, 1020 point zero, then I would probably want to go find all the 20s on the map. So here's a 20, here's another 20, here's a 20, okay. And then um, here in Minneapolis, the pressure is 1022. And here in La Crosse, Wisconsin, the pressure is 1017. So there's a 20 in here too, maybe right about there. Okay, and this isn't 20, this exactly, this is 20.7. So I'm not gonna draw my line directly on that dot by Duluth. But I look at Duluth to Escanaba, and I note that this is 1015, this is 1020.7, so the 20 is probably gonna be somewhere right here. Same thing here, 20. And the 20 will be somewhere over here in between Winnipeg and Minot. So your line would look something like this. I'm not gonna draw the entire line, I'm just gonna start it for you. Okay. You're gonna do the lines as far as you can for each of those isobars. I believe you do 1016, 1020, and 1022. And some of them may make a circle, kind of like you saw on figure two and three. So pay attention to figure two and three as well as you're drawing these, and your isobars should look similar to the way they're drawn on those figures. These questions are really just concept questions. Um, this one here, what is the difference in pressure indicated by two adjacent isobars? You can just take the difference between the two as indicated on figures two or three. And then here, you already sort of answered this question already. And then some of those other questions as well. Okay. That is it for the tutorial. You can use this table as well. I guess I should mention this. You, you can use this table as well in your um, problem for this particular question. So as you're drawing your isobars, you can also use this table. But I believe, I believe, yeah, most of the numbers are already indicated on here. Yeah, that is true, actually. I see that. So the table is really just showing you the, the actual pressures. And in the figure, it's just showing you the three number abbreviation of the pressures. So that may help you as you're determining how to draw the isobars. Okay, I hope this tutorial is helpful and best wishes as you complete this lab.